evening, everybody. I'm Jeremy McGovern with American Farriers Journal, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, this is our first Farrier Q&A live session, and the uh, topic we're going to go through this week and the next few weeks are uh, business topics related to COVID-19. This is your opportunity to ask questions, and we've uh, brought the great Tom Cruin with us, the Hall of Fame Farrier, and Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Tom. Glad to be here, Jeremy. So, Tom, you uh, started shoeing in 1972. Uh, we know you as the patch man. Tell, tell us a little bit more about your career and uh, how it progressed there since you started back in 72. Well, 72 was uh, a young 18 and uh, pretty much a lost soul for many years. Came across a big, tall Texan named Bernie Chapman, and we became great friends, and he kind of guided me down the road. And As I got better in the show jumping world and show hunters and uh, still messing with thoroughbreds and standard breads, and um, he taught me a lot. We went a lot of places together. He taught me the most important things about knowing all the anatomy, that uh, no more than the next guy was all of his uh, secret kind of success. And it's true. Uh, uh, I don't think it's taught enough yet today. Uh, we kind of put it on the back burner too many times. But he guided me along, and I, I kept going, and I kept specializing and specializing. Eventually, I got into quarter cracks and uh, glue on shoes, and uh, it led to about 14 countries in the world and a lot of air miles. Uh, many, many, many great athletes to work on, and uh, many things I would never trade. Okay, I'm looking here, and we got uh, quite a few people on. I see friends in California. Uh, nice to have you joining us from Australia, Wes. Uh, people from all across the U.S. and uh, I think, you know, no matter how you feel about this pandemic, your business is going to get affected by it. And that's why, uh, you know, Tom's graciously spending some time with us. We'll have some farriers with different backgrounds because maybe you're not, you know, in the performance horse world. Maybe you work more with backyard horses. But I think the, the advice is going to be practical no matter where you work or the type of horses, but we'll, we'll mix it up each week with a different farrier. So, uh, we'll jump right into this. Uh, you can see on the Zoom panel, there's a sec section for uh, Q&A. You can type your questions in there. If you want to type it into the chat section, uh, I'll find those and uh, I'll ask them of Tom. So either the Q&A section or chat, just feel free to type in your questions and we'll go through as many as possible. So I'll, I'll start with one, Tom, and, and we've talked about this a little bit. Uh, you spend a fair amount of time on the road with your business. Uh, knowing the, the restrictions, the advice on social distancing, everything in between, before you go to a barn and when you're at a barn, how, how do you prepare? Well, I usually, uh, I usually always call the day before I get into an area, uh, whether it be two or three barns or one barn all day long. I talk to who's ever running that show there, and I make sure that, Nobody's been sick. Nobody's got a fever. Nobody seems sick. Has there been anything going on? And so far, I've been lucky. Everybody's been good. Um, the the only one that seemed to uh, has been affected by this was the guy that does all my travel arrangements in New York. And he had it six weeks ago. That that guy was so sick it wasn't even funny for for a week. And we finally figured out he had it. And he was a mess. So I got something to kind of go by and how people act. But most every barn, I know in, I was in Kentucky the last few days, and, and um, everybody in Kesmark uh, up there, the, all employees were wearing masks, gloves. Uh, um, people that were going in and out, uh, like me, uh, we weren't so much as, but uh, we weren't required but all employees were, and they've done a great job with it. But a lot of barns are doing that. And uh, there are barns in the industry that 
stall cleaners go work in as many as five different locations in a day. So they've clamped down on them pretty hard. All those guys have got to prove they haven't been sick. They got to be in a mask. They got to be in a glove. They got to change it from barn to barn. So I think, I think everybody's trying to do their part. Um, I, 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 I've got a bottle, a spray bottle of alcohol uh, near my tools, and I spray them all day long. All day long, I spray them down with uh, 70 or 90% alcohol, whatever I can get. And it uh, does make it uh, smell better, but uh, hopefully it's killing off anything. Was uh, biosecurity much of a concern before this for you? The what? The biosecurity cleaning tools is, is, is um, a hard thing to get. You know, I, I, ne- I never did before. I, uh, Jeremy, I never did before. I, I, um, as long as there wasn't a, a serious disease in a horse that, that I felt was transmittable, uh, I never did that uh, before. I've known guys that have for a couple of years. Uh, they've all, at the end of the day, I, I've always seen them spray their whole shoe and box down with alcohol. And uh, I see a few people have joined us late. If you want to uh, ask a question of Tom, uh, feel free to uh, drop that into the chat field or the the Q and A field, and we'll go through those uh, as as they're sent in. Um, you know, I think the we've gone through tough times. Nothing like this before. It, it, it's a it's a strange thing, and and maybe we haven't seen the very tough times. That, you know, the trickle down of clients losing their job, losing their income, and how that will affect the farriers. Uh, but, you know, we've had recessions before. We've had uh, tough economic times. Uh, you know, going back through your career, what advice do you have to still sustain your business during a difficult time financially? Well, I, I, think, the, I think the guys and girls at the lowest end of the, the starting chain there, uh, the lower markets, um, the small hometown farriers that, you know, they, they three mornings of the week, they might eat breakfast with half their clients at a Waffle House. Who knows? Those are the guys I think are going to, those are the guys that need to keep working because they don't, they don't, they haven't made it yet. They're still trying to buy the proper tools, the nice upgrade, their shoe and rig, attend seminars. Uh, they're still trying to advance and these are the guys that are going to get pounded the hardest because their clients are the ones that are going to take off shoes, trim them, make those horses go 10, 12 weeks without a trim and knock those guys out of a, a, you know, an income that they were used to. These are the boys and girls that are going to hit, get hit the hardest. So that I think any of the, the guys that have big successful business, if you can, Pick those guys and girls up once a, one day of the week, even two days of the week. Let them clinch and finish for you and pull off, clean your rig, uh, keep them in the game a little bit. Um, somebody asked me the other day, they said, well, you know, there doesn't seem to be going to be a Kentucky Derby this year. What, what are they going to do with all those three-year-olds? I said, well, we're not going to kick them in the field. <laughs> That's for sure. I said, they have to stay in training. You can't take seven, 800 stallions and go throw them in the field. And I said, they're worth too much money, and they're going to stay in training. And then there are tracks still running. Um, the, just the other day here in Florida, uh, Tampa's, Tampa is going – they're trying to extend their race dates because people have stayed down here now. And they were due to close. And I, I, haven't, I haven't seen where they're going with it now, but uh, I know a lot of leading trainers that – leave from here, go to Keeneland, then the Derby, do the Churchill meet, and then go to New York. They're, they're here. They're not, they're not going anywhere. They're staying in South Florida. Uh, there's no reason to go to New York right now. Um, they don't want to go into it uh, and take the chance on most of them. Most of the top trainers move those horses out. Uh, a lot of them up there are still going, but, uh, a lot of people are fortunate, you know, their, their, their clients are have to keep going with these athletes. They can't shut them down. Uh, we're going to get out of this. We're going to go forward. And the horses need to stay on as close to the schedule as they can because athletes, 
let's face it, they come with they come with issues. A lot of them have issues. A lot of them require pretty precision horseshoeing on a, on a very regular basis. And they just can't stretch those things. They can't take a four-week horse and go stretch him out to eight, nine weeks and, and keep him in training at the same time. It will not work. They will come up with other injuries. But uh, I, I think that most farriers, the large percentage of them are going to keep going. Some of them are going to back up. But I, I do feel we try – Probably everybody around the country needs to kind of look out for these younger horseshoers because I think they're going to get hit the hardest. Yeah. Now, with the the sport horse world, the performance horses, you you know, they're still going to be in training even if there aren't events. Do you think you'll see much of an impact there in terms of loss of work, or uh, you know, are they the type that are going to stretch out uh, the cycle? I, th- I think the, I think the, the major sport horses are going to stay in the game. Um, uh, I was on the backside of Keeneland this morning, very before the sun came up this morning, and they were working. And I, I watched horses and uh, looked at a couple, and then I was over into Kesmark, and, and we were working on sport horses that uh, uh, two of them actually are coming out of there in another week going back home. They've, they've, we've, we've rehabbed what we needed to, and, they're staying in big, complete work. Uh, I, I think, uh, and you and you will separate some of the uh, players in the game. I mean, some owners uh, play above their head in this in the sport horse business. Some of them won't have the money to keep going in this. Uh, um, and there's a lot of trainers. You get you get a lot of uh, show trainers. Let's face it; they don't make their money off of boarding and and 30-day training bills. They make it off of schooling, going to the shows, showing in the ring. That's where they make the big money. That's where they – and they're without it. Um, and they know they're without it. And I think it's going to affect them. But I think most of the smarter people, they know that if they have a quality horse, they're, they're going to have to keep the shoeing up because uh, those feet – keep the whole entire horse moving. So the, the clients that, that don't recognize that don't, uh, you know, that think of it in terms of money saved versus the long-term view of what the, that damage could do to their horse. And then the subsequent vet bills, what do you do with them? Do you have a conversation? How do you convince someone who who's maybe thinking about stretching out a cycle to, to keep it tight? You you can uh, you can sit down with it and and really, Jeremy each each horse is it's, it's just like showing a bar on the horses. Each one in there is an individual, and and there may be a couple in the string that could make it a two or three extra weeks, but there's some in there that can. And yeah, you're going to have to sit down with those clients, trainers, owners, and say, look, this is what I think about this horse. This is what I think about that, and. We're a service company. They're going to make the final decision whether they're going to spend the money with us or not. We can't we can't force them into it. Um, but you know we have to put it out there that if you don't agree with it, tell them you don't agree with it because don't let it come back along later on and bite you on the backside. Okay. Um, everybody, uh, there's few of you who've joined us recently. Uh, we have a couple of fields here, the Q&A field or the chat field. If you'd like to type in a question, I'll ask it of Tom. Uh, so getting, uh, getting back to the younger people you think are going to be impacted, um, how do you put, you, you, you know, you're, you're having your business that's not affected, looking out for them. What do you suggest? Some ride-alongs, maybe getting a helper for a day? Yeah, I do. I, I think that, I think that, uh, you know, if, if you if you know of any any young guys in your area, young guys, young girls, uh, there's so many young guys and young girls today. Um, you're going to be able to. They're they're going to come come crying. They're going to let you know they're they're out of work or things are slowing down. Or, you know, get a ride along. Buy them lunch to go with you and help you. Teach them a little bit. Share some knowledge with them. That's what. Uh, that's what they need right now. They need to keep their head in the game and not get discouraged because a lot of them may. 
uh, I don't know at this point what other career they would run off to that looks highly productive. But uh, I think anything that we can do to help the younger kids stay focused on, you know, uh, this, this will get by us and uh, we'll get better and we'll get done in the, in the eighties when the, when the market was a mess. Uh, things really slowed down in the hunter jumper market. We had to, we had to stretch horses out. We had to, uh, we had to reduce down some shoeing jobs, some things that they, you know, if, if you had a bar shoe type setup on something, uh, old creaky, uh, kind of equitation horse, well, he was just going to have to learn how to get along with the regular shoe for a while, you know. And and we got through it, um, but some things backed up. But but this pandemic is uh, apples and oranges to the 80s. It really is. It's, it's, a, it's a whole different deal here. I mean, you, you, you'll see some people that are in the horse business that may not ever recover. Uh, and and uh, all the shoers high to the low, uh, the the experience to the to the beginners, they will have to understand that uh, they may see a client never again because they may have to get out. Yeah. I mean, I, it it's going to happen. It, it, different parts of the country, different disciplines of horses, it's going to happen. Yeah, and I think that's that's what makes it tough is. Uh, you know, shoeing ranch lot horses in, in Oklahoma is very different than being in a highly dense area like the the Mid Atlantic, where you have your choice of, of sport horses, and uh, may, makes it a little difficult to to provide sort of some universal advice. Uh, I'll ask a question that was sent in here. Uh, it's a good one because I think it it kind of leads us into the discussion of cash flow. But how how do you handle receiving payment for your services? Prompt. <laughs> Prompt is the word. Um, took a lot of years. Uh, all of my clients, um, and I, there's some clients I don't see for years. I talk to them regular, but uh, they keep a credit card on file in my office. And when I go and their horses or horse is done, worked on, um, that service is charged to that credit card plus 4%. I'm not going to lose 4%. I mean, I'm providing a credit card for their convenience, not mine. If they don't want to do that, somebody needs to pay me at the barn. Don't, this is not the time, especially with the uncertainty, to be the bank for everybody. And I'm sure they're a nice customer and you like them and their kid's nice and they got a nice dog. But this is still a service business. You must be paid. You're not going to get Sears out to fix your washing machine right now, put them off for 90 days. It ain't going to happen. So you have, you have to run a business. You still have to be a business person. And this is a service business. You've got to be paid. And if you can't get paid, you, you just you can't do the work. You really can't. And you don't. You don't want to put anybody off and you certainly don't want to seem the bad guy, but you know, anybody will let you work for free. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that, that can be difficult because you know, you, you build a rapport, especially maybe with some backyard clients, get exactly. together family and, and uh, you have to have a difficult conversation. And uh, so let's say those, those people who are watching us, uh, you know, tend to do it by check 30 days, but, move to more of your service for immediate payment. How do you, what advice do you have for introducing that to a client, especially when it may feel a bit uncomfortable uh, during a, a financially tough times like some are dealing with? Yeah, well, we've all known, we, we've all in this business over the years, we've all had clients that owned horses and we've had horses that have owned clients. And those clients are, are usually the ones that can't pay. They, they well, I, you know, I remember 45 years ago having clients. Uh, they were pretty good all year long until December. 
and they wanted their horses done in December, but well, we we got to pay you next next month. We it's Christmas, and you know I finally had to tell a few of them. You know we're having a Christmas over at Tom's house too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a thing that if you let it get away from you, and nobody likes to always have that discussion about money. A lot of clients don't want to have it with who they hire and the guy that's hired. He wants to look at the dirt and shuffle his feet when he's talking about what he charges. This is a business. It's a professional business. You have got to run it like a business or it will not be a business. You will, you will be a taken advantage of every day and you just can't do that. And, the thing is, is yeah, we all have worked for friends over the years and people that we've known for 20, 30 years. It's a hard thing to separate. And sometimes you have got to take the, the upper road on it and, and say, look, this, this is how I make a living. This is how I feed my family. This is how I pay my bills. And for me to do this work, I have to be paid. Uh, kind of a piggyback on the, the previous question, what about those clients who don't have a credit card? Uh, how do you establish that with either immediate cash or check? Cash or check at the barn. It's, it's, a, it's a simple thing. Um, and they know when you're coming. Everybody in this day and manner, especially the, the uh, I remember in the 70s having to sit on the phone starting on Tuesday, Wednesday night calling all my trim clients to line them up for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and I'd have to call them all on the telephone, remind them I was coming that day. So you had, you know, the, these days everybody's electronic. They're texting, they're emailing, they're, they're this, and everybody's in around the country. They're, they're somewhere between a four to six to maybe seven-week schedule, depending on the type of horse it is and what it's doing. So they know you're coming. They got time to have a check at that barn. And I, I know uh, one young man in South Florida that, that worked for me four years, and he's got a great business. And to this day, when he rolls in there on some clients, if that check's not there, he'll roll right back out. He, he is not afraid to do it. He's lost a few, but he's gained a few. And, and he, he, he will, he's very stern about it, and I don't blame him. He's, uh, you've got to kind of train these clients, too. If you let them take advantage of you, they will do it because they did it to the last guy before you. Yeah. You know, and I think it's, you know, it's, uh, it's fair. When, if you get hurt, a client's not going to wait for you to get better. Uh, some exactly. clients will. And uh, if uh, you're late or if there's some thing they want to blame on you, something's wrong with the horse that has nothing to do with the foot, but somehow it's the farrier's fault, there's not going to be a lot of sympathy for you there either. So, Exactly. You, you blow a truck training. engine up. They're not going to take up a collection for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, what, what are your thoughts on discounting? If Say you know a client is furloughed. Uh, what would you think about providing either temporary discounting or uh, working something out with that client? That's kind of a one-on-one -on -one deal and it's, it's going to have to be that farrier uh, with his relation and how long has it been and, you know, um, are you going to get paid down the road? Um, I mean, I've, I've, over my long career, I've, I only ever had to take one person to court and, and, it, and I was 46 years in the business before it happened. And, and um, I, never, I never got any money out of them, but I, I turned their world upside down in the court. I mean, they finally had to go Chapter 7, 11, and anything else I could. Um, and I hated doing it, but it got down to that, that it was the principle of it because they kept hiring me two rounds – and I knew they I knew they were in a little bit of difficult, but they had to, they had a very good horse with a pending sale. Uh, his feet were good, and um, I gave in a little and felt that well if I helped him along, and 
turn around and bit me right in the ass. I mean, it really did. And I, and, and I just couldn't believe that after that many years, um, I was going to have to go through the court system to try to recover money. Um, I've had uh, over the years, and probably everybody out there has, uh, you'll have certain clients you're going to do more for because you, you know they're in a time of their life. They're, somebody was sick in the family. They had a death in the family. They, their, their, their kid got sick. Their kid broke his leg. The kid's got to go to college. Uh, um, you've had people that uh, wrecked a vehicle, wrecked a trailer load of horses, half the barn burnt down. I mean, the stories go on and on and on. So, so it's a one-on-one -on -one deal. It's, it's whatever your personal relation is with that client. If, if you feel, you know, that you can help them and, and later on they're, they're going to they're gonna pay it back to you, they're going to they're gonna make things right with you, sure, do it. And I don't think you, I don't think you discount it. I, I just think, you know, help them along and um, don't work for free. Make sure that you're going to get it back at some point because you didn't get the gasoline, the tires on your truck, the propane in your forge, the nails, the shoes, the, the wear and tear on your body. None of that's free anywhere. So, so at some point you've got to get paid back. But if, if, there's a, if there's a special situation where you feel you need to help a client, sure, I, I think you should do it. But, you know, it's got to have a start and it's got to have an end. So you're nearly 50 years in this industry and you've seen a lot of clients. Uh, I see some, some of our friends on here, fellow Hall of Famer Ada Gates, but uh, a few young farriers on here too. Uh, for those younger farriers, sure you've built a, a very good system uh, you, where you can hone in on a client that a BS detector, this person might be a late payer, what what are some of the cues that say keep keep an eye on this client? Well, I think going into any whenever whenever a horse shearer goes into a barn, they've called you to come in there to speak to them about shoeing their horse or trimming their horses or doing the footwork that's required every four to six to seven to eight weeks, whatever it is, and you are. 99 and 9 tenths of the, the horseshoers are entering into a verbal contract. But probably 90% of the horseshoers don't treat it that way. Right then, day one is when you lay down the rules. The outline of how your business works, when you come, how you come, what you charge, what you do, what you don't do. Um, you, you, you have to put all this out in front and have a uh, gentleman's agreement, handshake, whatever. Everybody has to understand that. Uh, I've known people over the years, they put it in writing to their clients. Um, I've never gone that far, but I do know that it has been done. And the biggest mistake that a lot of young farriers make is that, sure, I'll trim them, I'll be here next Tuesday. And that's it. And then he comes next Tuesday and he works on seven horses and asked the little girl in the barn, where's, where's my check? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. And then you can't get a hold of that owner that told you to trim those horses. Can't get a hold of them for a week. So it's, 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 it has to be done in advance. The, this is the world we live in. And everything else we do in this world, when we have a service, we pay for it. When we fill up our trucks, go into those accounts at the gas station, we have to pay for that gas. We put it on a credit card, but we know we got to pay that bill. Um, we stop and get lunch, we got to pay for that food. We get those supplies, we got to pay for those supplies. So if we're doing it and we're abiding by it, don't let the customers not be part of that. You have to step up and be a business person and make them understand that you're providing a service and will do what they're asking you to do. But in turn, you have to be paid on, on your uh, obligations too. Okay. Uh, we got time for a, a few more questions. There's a couple here that have come in. 
if you're a little late to this, uh, feel free uh, to type in something into the, uh, the Q&A field or the chat field, and, and we'll try to wrap these up. There's a couple here that, that are tied together, uh, but uh, your, your prices, how do you inform clients about what your prices are? My particular prices or? Well, I guess in general, general. What, what philosophy do you believe in, you know, uh, having a, if you charge a standard rate, how, how do you let a client know? I'm sure pricing always comes up for every farrier. It might be the first question some clients even ask when they call you up. Sure. You, you can, uh, I'm not, I've known farriers that the, the, the majority of them, it's a, it's a verbal, but I know farriers that they have a price sheet. They really do. Um, and, and, you know, th there are levels in this business where people say, I don't care what it costs, get the damn thing fixed. Get it back in the, on the track or in the ring. Um, the majority of the country, the people do want to know what they're paying. And believe me, every time you, you raise that 10 or $15, they're, gonna, they're not going to like it. They're not going to jump up and down. But... Uh, cost of living is the same for you as it is for them. It really is. Um, let them know what it is right up front. Straight trims, ever how many weeks it is. Uh, front shoes, trim the behind. This is what always got me. If a, if a guy charged, uh, and this is just for instance, this is not the exact figure. Say, say a guy charged... Uh, $40 for, or $50 to trim a horse. And then they said, well, let, let's put front shoes on it. And so, we, so that guy was getting, say, 150 for four shoes. So he goes back down to 75. Well, it should be the 75 plus 25 for trimming the back you're going to still trim four. So you have to make all that known up front. I mean, this is a, this is a business. Don't, the more you do for the horse, it's not discounts in there. You have to be charged for all your time. The more time you're on a horse, the clock's ticking. And, and it cuts down on how many stops you can make a day. And I'm not saying race the clock. Um, I don't like hearing horseshoers walk in a barn and go, get him out here. I got to go. Hurry up. I, come on. I got to go. I don't like, I don't like hearing that out of I've heard it a lot. Younger guys make that mistake. Uh, you're getting paid to be there and do something. You're going to charge, do the job, spend the time, do it correctly, but make, make them aware of, you know, pads are extra. The, the pores are extra. The squirt in pads are extra. This is extra. Um, I think, I think a lot of guys, the younger guys make a serious mistake about, uh, they'll charge extra for clips. They'll charge extra for trailers. They'll charge extra for aluminum. Get you a set fee up here and be done with it. It's four shoes. I don't care if you gold plated the damn things. Get four shoes there and stay with it. Quit tagging on, tagging on, tagging on. Because most horses that need clips or trailers, they're a performance type horse anyway. That's part of the job. Be done with it. Um, and it's easy to do. If, if, the more open and honest you are up with the client, the more that they know what they're going to have to spend in the beginning, they're going to be easier with it. If you keep hitting them along the way with, well, that was extra. That was extra. Well, this is $25 more than last month. Yeah, but I did this. You know, get get all that stuff up front. Uh, even if you have to put a rate sheet out. I mean, it's going to be different at all levels of the business. It, it really is. Uh, but I'm, I'm one for a flat fee. Uh, I'm not one for extra if it's aluminum or extra if it's got clips or extra. Get a fee up there to where you know you're making money and be done with it. Something we've just talked about, and uh, 
Uh, Farrier, we were talking about before we jumped on here, Curtis Burns has a nice statement here. Givers have to set limits because takers have none. <laughs> yeah, Curtis would know about that. Yeah. So uh, a couple of things you're, you're touching on, and, and you know, especially when you're getting into the therapeutic world, uh, there, there might be more of a time investment. Maybe you're waiting on the vet, uh, taking radiographs. Uh, you know, there, how, how do you balance your time? How do you budget time and figure that into your pricing uh, in, in, in barns you might be spending more time at? Well, when you, when you get up to certain levels in this business to where you're a specialist in, in um, uh, you mentioned Curtis there, Curtis and myself and a few others around California, New York. Uh, I, I know all of them that, that they move around by day fees. It's so much a day and all the expenses, the flight, the rental car, the hotel, the mails, you name it. And we roll for a day. It might be one foot or one horse or two or three horses in a day, and that's it. But you've got us for the whole day, and that's going to cover everything. If I have to spend all that time uh, evaluating a horse's soundness, when I have a horse, horse in a rehab center and I want to spend time watching them swim, I want to watch them going in and out of hyperbaric chambers, I want to see the change in their bodies, uh, I want to look at new radiographs, I want to spend time talking with the vet that did it, uh, going over the blood work, checking thyroid levels, this, that, everything that pertains back to the feet. You've got to put a lot of time into it. Uh, event consultations. Uh, I know what horseshoes in this business charge for vet consultations, and I know which ones don't. And there's not very many that do. But if you've got to sit over there for an hour on site, or 30 minutes on site and three other phone calls with a certain vet. It pretty much took an hour out of your day. And say if you're a, a good horseshoe on a hundred jumper circuit, you're knocking down three, three hundred dollars an hour and more. There it is, charge for it. It took an hour out of your time. You you've got to be paid for your time. You can't keep stopping uh, to go over things. And uh, evaluation is a is a thing that a lot of horseshoers don't charge for. And, and I mean, I think it, I think it only relates in certain groups, certain activities in this horse business. And it's a certain level type of horseshoer. The young guys certainly are not going to be in that because they don't have the education yet. They don't have the experience to where they're in that deep of conversations that, uh, that warrant that, but they'll get there if they keep striving. And I mean, and, and, you know, you, you can't only charge in this business what the market's going to bear. I, I, where I live in Florida, I haven't worked on horses in this county in 25 years. None. Now, some get hauled in here, but my prices here are just way above what, what is common. A lot of them want to call and ask questions, um, but the, the market won't bear it here. And, I mean, that's – but it's kind of nice. I can live here and nobody bothers me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, the other thing is inventory. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on inventory management? I write down, I have a spreadsheet on every, every set of show horses or race horses that I do regular. If they're, if they're a regular client, I've got that horse's name and what shoe was put on the front and the hind every month, whether it was new or reset. So three weeks into my month, I can go through those sheets and, and I can look and I know exactly what I'm using, exactly what shoes, exactly what nails. And that's how I order my inventory. I see guys, uh, I, I look to the shoe and rig, uh, um, God, it's been some time back in New York. It was, a, it was a beautiful trailer. It was a gooseneck type trailer. And this guy on the front wall of that thing had 87 pegs to hold horseshoes. And I, I, you know, I was astounded. I said, my God, 
how many horses does this guy do? <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do with all them horseshoes? I mean, it's just, I think a lot of guys can, can overbuy. You can, it's easy to overbuy in this business. And nowadays, we've got great supply companies all over the major hotspots of the horse business. And you can get stuff pretty much overnight, two days. Well, you most of a lot of them will ship U.S. mail, and you'll have shoes in two or three days. Um, I mean, most of the time when I want uh, Polyflex from Curtis, I, I, don't, I don't drive the 90 miles. or I could be within five miles there, and I won't go by there. It's easier for me to tell uh, Diane Byrne to uh, stick it in the uh, U.S. Postal, and it's at my house in 48 hours. So it's don't overbuy. Don't don't waste all your money on a bunch of stuff that's that's just not there. Tools, spend the money on the tools, not inventory. In, inventories you can you can keep track of, but keep quality tools, quality drill player, presses, grinders, rasp are a biggie. Uh, young people use the dullest rasp in the world. I mean, they think a rasp is supposed to go forever. You know, they, they just got to realize, it. change that thing out and go. It's, it's on. The sharper, the better. And, um, but inventory, you need, to have, you need to have some on your rig, but a lot of people overdo it. And, and you need to have a, a stash at your residence, in your garage, a backyard shed, something like that. But you can get shoes, nails, pads, everything pretty fast these days. Yeah. All right. uh, two more questions. And uh, this is a good one. This is uh, something I, I've been thinking about. We're, we're practicing distancing and, and trying to avoid people at barns. How do you say, stay safe if an owner or the barn staff requests that you work on horses alone during this pandemic? Well, I won't. Um, I'm just not going to do it. I think that if uh, they have a holder that's uh, wearing a mask, wearing gloves, uh, their person is safe. Um, their person is not going to handle my equipment, and I'm not going to pat them on the back. Um, that we're not going to exchange handshakes or cough on each other and none of that. I'll do my work and they do their work. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, in, in barns today, everything's changed. And horses know that there's a change going on. All of a sudden, there's nobody in the barn all day long. You know, one guy came through in the morning, dumped feed, and everybody left because they've put the barn off limits to horse owners, won't let them come in there. And then all of a sudden, the horseshoe is supposed to come in there by himself in that quiet barn and pull one horse out who may not be the most uh, pleasant horse in the whole barn to begin with. Well, that horse has got every right to be nervous and a little fidgety, you know. It's been quiet. Nobody's been around. All of a sudden, this guy's yanking my feet around and beating on him and running a sand buffer up and down my foot. And... That's the quickest way to start getting hurt. I, I think I think that uh, barns, managers, trainers, they have their requirements during these times. I think we got to have ours too. Mm -hmm. We need to feel that we are safe. It only takes one of these horses, it don't take two seconds, and they can put a crippling injury on your body. I mean, they are so fast when they're panic scared and you are out of work for a long time or permanent. So uh, I think you can, uh, I think you can really go to the, who's ever running the barn and have that conversation and work it out to where everybody is protected and, and they're safe, you know, but it's, it's ultimately it, it's us under. I mean, I think a farrier probably can uh, survive uh, COVID-19, but he's not going to do very good with a, you know, a left hook to the jaw. Right. Okay, for our, our final question for Tom, 
How do you overcome industry standards when it comes to charging for consultations and such? What industry standards? <laughs> there are none. This is uh, this is our own business. We we are our creators. We are allowed to run our business the way we feel. Once you get knowledge, reputation, skills, um, knowledge, you run your business how you seem fit. If you want to stand there for two hours and talk to everybody about a shoe job and then them go down to the end of the barn and come back and 30 minutes later and say, no, nah, we're not going to go with that. You waste a lot of time, you know, but if you're going to charge for a consultation, it has to be a professional consultation. You got to put all your cards up on the table, no matter what the trainer thinks, the veterinarian thinks, they, they all get their chance to put up, but then you put yours up and then the owner has to make the final, final decision who they're going to go with. We can't force anybody to do it our way, but there are no standards in, in what to charge and not to charge uh, when it comes to consultation on, on these horses. And yet with that said, it's going to be different in all levels of this business. I mean, we have so many tiers across the country in our business. I mean, uh, I mean, when I, I remember when I started in 72, uh, trimming dairy horses, if you've ever, if any of y'all out there ever trimmed a dairy horse, that's not fun. I mean, they're, they're, they're covered in cow manure from their bellies down. And there's no shade, to, but I remember those were four dollars a head back then. And, and um, you know, they 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 didn't much less care what I thought. Just trim the damn horse. That's all they wanted. And so, as you progress up the ladder in this business, which hopefully that's what you want to do. And again, if you live in an area that the market's going to bear so much, well, I'm. I'm sorry, that's that's where you're going to be. You're going to be life locked there if you're going to stay in this business. You choose choose that, and a lot of people do, and there's nothing wrong. It's, it's a good hometown, got good schools, kids play football and all that. But as you go up, get more professional, more knowledge, go to all the conventions and all the learning, um, you spent time and money doing that. So your knowledge become becomes – Use, uh, useful in determining what's best for a horse. And your knowledge is now worth something. And you don't want to give it away because it costs you to get it. So, and it's, it's just going to vary from farrier to farrier. And it's not anything about who's the best or who did this or who did that. It's just a business deal. What your direct market will bear. And it's something that everybody's going to have to wade into and figure it out on their own, depending on what disciplines of horses they work on, um, what area of the country they live. Um, you know, working at Belmont Racetrack is opposed to uh, um, East Jesus, New Mexico. It's going to be a way different market. It, it, and, and, there's not going to be any, some parts of the country, that they're not going to understand the word consultation. They, they just think, well, you're the horse, you're, you're supposed to talk about this. But there, there's market that's, that's going to happen. There ain't no stopping it. And it just depends on where everybody wants to go and, and what they think their time is worth. That's what it comes down to. All right. I think that's a good place for us to wrap up. And uh, if you uh, – Looking for more educational opportunities this weekend, American Farriers Journal is hosting its first performance horse hoof care online classroom. It's a virtual conference we're doing on hunter jumpers. So uh, a few different speakers on that, Jason Critton, Grant Moon, and uh, trainer Ron Danta to talk about uh, hunter jumpers from the perspective of the trainer. But uh, a couple weeks ago, this wasn't an idea of mine. Tom reached out and 
wanted to share some of his knowledge and we talked about the best way of doing that. And I think Tom hit it out of the park tonight and uh, uh, very gracious with his time and his knowledge. And just want to thank you, Tom, for, for helping us out tonight. Glad to help you, Jeremy. Okay. And thank you to everyone else for, for joining us tonight. Uh, we'll have another one of these sessions next week, uh, same time, Thursday night at uh, 8 p.m. Central. Uh, joining us next week will be Shane Westman and Alex Garcia. So two farriers for the price of one. Shane is a farrier who uh, is originally from uh, Bow, Washington, and now works at Davis. And then uh, Alex Garcia is another farrier there in uh, California who's in a uh, private practice. So uh, we'll, we'll ask them questions. Feel free to bring a whole new set of questions, and we'll go through those. So again, thank you to Tom, and thank you to everyone else. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you again. Good night. Good night, all.